Hi, I am Ajit Virkud, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology from Mumbai. Hello citizens of the internet. Welcome to part 2 of my lecture on uterine fibroids. In this part, I am going to discuss the clinical features, diagnosis and management of uterine fibroids. Before I start, a tip for my loyal readers to watch my videos repeatedly. I have provided time-wise hyperlinks below in the box showing the published date and the title of the video which will help you to jump to the various sections of the video like diagnosis and treatment. First, I will dwell at length on the clinical features of uterine fibroids. Many women, as many as 50% with fibroids are asymptomatic and fibroids are discovered accidentally during a bimanual examination or an ultrasound examination. The larger the fibroid, the greater the likelihood of symptoms. The most common symptoms are menstrual symptoms like menorrhagia, metrorrhagia, acyclic bleeding, spasmodic or congestive dysmenorrhea. The nearer the fibroid is to the endometrium, the greater the likelihood of menstrual symptoms. A woman with a large fibroid arising from the pelvis and lying in the peritoneal cavity may present with complaints of lump in the abdomen. It can also produce a sensation of weight in the pelvis. The bulky uterus beset with fibroids can press on the bladder producing urinary symptoms such as urinary frequency, nocturia and urgency. A large cervical or broad ligament fibroid can exert pressure and occlude the urethrovesical junction or the urethra and produce acute retention of urine. A long-standing large fibroid occupying the entire pelvis may press on the ureters producing initially hydroureter and later hydronephrosis. Very rarely, a large fibroid impacted in the pelvis can press on the rectosigmoid and produce constipation. Pain as a symptom of fibroids is usually absent. Pain is present only if there is red degeneration of the fibroid, torsion of the pedicle, sarcomatous degeneration in a fibroid or if it is associated with endometriosis or if there is impaction of the fibroid in the pelvis. Infection of a fibroid polyp lying in the vagina can lead to foul smelling discharge. There seems to be a cause and effect relationship between infertility and fibroids. It is reported that 2 to 3 percent of subfertility cases are due solely to fibroids. Large fibroids located near the tubal ostea or the cervix are likely to affect fertility. They may also cause distortion of the endometrial cavity and affect implantation. The cause effect relationship between pregnancy and fibroids is not exactly known. However, Pregnancy can continue even with very large fibroids. Pregnancy with fibroids may end in a miscarriage or a preterm labor. This is because fibroids can interfere with enlargement of the uterus, initiate abnormal uterine contractions, prevent efficient placentation, and cause impaction in the pelvis. Endometrial vascular disturbance and inflammation associated with fibroids can also result in implantation failure or miscarriage. Other pregnancy related problems associated with fibroids in pregnancy are malposition, malpresentations like breach or transverse lie, obstructed labor and inefficient uterine contractions leading to postpartum hemorrhage and delayed involution of uterus. Anemia resulting from menorrhagia can lead to general symptoms like palpitation, 
फटी एंड वेट लॉस क्लिनिकल एग्जामिनेशन फाइंडिंग्स इन अ केस ऑफ फाइबर्ड आर एस फॉलोज ऑन इंस्पेक्शन ऑफ द एबडाम देर इज अ स्वेलिंग इन द लोअर एबडाम इफ द ट्यूमर इज मोर देन ट्वेल्व वीक्स इन साइज ऑन पैल्पेशन राउंडेड और लोबिलेटेड नॉन टेंडर फर्म टू हार्ट मोबाइल स्वेलिंग इज फेल्ट ऑन बाय मैनुअल पैल्पेशन द यूट्रस इज यूनिफॉर्मली एनलार्ज एंड फर्म इफ देर आर ओनली इंट्रामूरल फाइब्रॉइड और इट मे हैव अ मल्टी नॉडुलर और बॉसुलेटेड सर्फेस इफ देर आर सब सीरियस फाइब्रॉइड द ट्यूमर मास मे और मे नॉट बी कनेक्टेड विद द यूट्रस If it is a pedunculated fibroid lying in the lateral fornix it may move independently from the uterus Speculum examination may show a smiling os if anterior lip cervical fibroid is present or a frowning os if there is a posterior lip cervical fibroid A central cervical fibroid will produce a pinpoint os Sounding of the uterine cavity may be done if a myomatous polyp is suspected. The differential diagnosis of uterine fibroid is adenomyosis, ovarian tumor, pregnancy, other pelvic tumors, calcified pyo saltings and fecal. Taking a good medical and family history is very important for diagnosis of fibroids. Since fibroids tend to run in families, a positive history of fibroids in the first degree family members raises the suspicion of fibroids greatly. Trans abdominal or trans vaginal pelvic sonography is the gold standard investigation for diagnosis of the number, size and situation of uterine fibroids. On sonography, they are seen as well circumscribed non homogeneous masses fibroids being more vascular appear less echogenic that is hypoechoic than the surrounding myometrium sonographic appearance of fibroids may vary from hypo to hyperechoic depending on the ratio of the smooth muscle to fibrous tissue and whether there is degeneration in the tumor cystic degeneration may show areas of sonolucency whereas calcification may cause areas of echogenesis uterine fibroids show characteristic vascular patterns on color flow doppler ultrasound there is a peripheral rim of vessels from which a few vessels penetrate into the center of the fibroid color doppler is very important in differentiating a single intramural fibroid from an adenomyoma Sometimes a simple plain x-ray of the abdomen and the pelvis may help in diagnosis of fibroids if they are calcified. Calcification in fibroid is of three different types. This is a plain x-ray of the pelvis AP view showing X-shell that is peripheral calcification in a fibroid. This is a plain x-ray of the pelvis showing womb stone that is central calcification in a fibroid. A third type of calcification which may be seen in a fibroid is in point calcified area giving a mulberry appearance. It is also referred to as popcorn calcification if there are fluffy areas of calcification. Magnetic resonance imaging is another important investigation for diagnosis of fibroids. The characteristic appearance of fibroids on T2 weighted contrast MR imaging is round low signal intensity masses with sharp margins separating them from the surrounding myometrium some serous fibroids will show a high signal intensity ring around the fibroids that is due to dilated veins or lymphatics around the fibroids fibroids which are less than 5 mm in diameter called seedling fibroids which can be missed on ultrasonography are easily identifiable on mri imaging large fibroids that are beset with varying degrees of degenerative changes are seen as heterogeneous masses 
MR imaging is specially warranted for fibers less than 2 cm in diameter that are often based on ultrasound. MRI is also very useful for differentiating an adenomyoma from an intramural fibroid. I have already explained this in my adenomyosis video. Hysterosalpingography, saline infusion sonography, and hysteroscopy may have a role in the diagnosis of submucous polyps. This is a digital HSG plate showing a submucous fibroid at the fundus. This saline infusion sonography shows a submucous fibroid polyp. Hysteroscopy is commonly used for diagnosis of submucous fibroid polyps. It has the advantage of allowing the assessment of the endometrium also. Here is a diagnostic hysteroscopy showing fibroid polyp near the right coronal opening. Prior to myomectomy, it is very important to detect all the fibroids in the uterus, however small, because fibroids that are not detected and therefore not removed will lead to higher rate of recurrence after myomectomy. Traditional ultrasonography cannot detect fibroids smaller than 2 cm in diameter, that is, seedling fibroids. MR imaging is a superior imaging technique for the so-called fibroid mapping because it can not only detect small seedling fibroids but also differentiate an adenomyoma from a fibroid. Most fibroids grow slowly, the median growth rate during reproductive years being 9% over 12 months according to one study. An increase of greater than 6 weeks of uterine size over a period of one year is considered by some as rapid growth. An important point to bear in mind is that multiple fibroids in the same individual may have highly variable growth rates, suggesting that their growth results from factors other than hormone levels. After the age of 35, growth rates decline with age for most women but not for African American women. A small percentage of fibroids may regress in size in the peri and postmenopausal period. Another characteristic feature is that in premenopausal women, rapid uterine growth almost never indicates presence of a uterine leomyosarcoma. Treatment depends on age, symptoms and whether pregnancy is desired or not. If fibroids are asymptomatic, then no treatment is necessary, but the patient must be kept under observation. Exceptions are uterine size more than 10 to 12 weeks, fibroids growing rapidly, if they are pedagogated and prone to torsion, if they are likely to complicate future pregnancy, or if diagnosis is in doubt. General treatment entails treatment of anemia, close observation and analgesia if necessary. Constant surveillance of their growth is also essential because fibroids can grow and become symptomatic. Patients, if married, should also be encouraged to become pregnant since fibroids regress in puberty. Treatment becomes imperative when fibroids become symptomatic. I will discuss the definitive treatment of fibroids under the following headings. Surgical treatment which can be conservative for example myomectomy or extirpative that is hysterectomy. Procedures such as LNG20 IUD. Medical treatment such as GnRH analogs or antagonists and newer procedures like uterine fibroid embolization, MRI focused ultrasound and myolysis. Myomectomy means surgical removal of only the fibroids in order to conserve the uterus. It can be performed by various routes. Open abdominal myomectomy is preferred in most cases like patients with multiple large fibroids. A pedunculated submucous polyp coming out of the external os can be removed by vaginal route. This is called as polypectomy. Trans cervical hysteroscopic resection of a sessile submucous fibroid polyp is done using a resectoscope. 
when there are just a few subserous or intramural fibroids of moderate size, they can be removed via laparoscopy or robotic technique. Provided facilities for the same are available and the care provider has the necessary skill and experience. In modern gynecology, most fibroids are removed by the laparoscopic technique. However, I am not in favor of this because in laparoscopic myomectomy, most of the principles of myomectomy laid down by Victor Bonnie are not followed. I favor open abdominal myomectomy. The main advantage of myomectomy is that fertility is preserved or enhanced. Disadvantages of myomectomy are considerable hemorrhage during surgery requiring blood transmission, persistence of menstrual symptoms, recurrence of fibroids, and adhesion formation which may lead to subsequent subfertility and may make subsequent myomectomy difficult. Patients should conceive soon after myomectomy, about 3 to 4 months later, since recurrence is already detectable 6 months after surgery. Cumulative pregnancy rate of 58.2% within the first year after my abdominal myomectomy has been reported. Recurrent myomas after myomectomy are common, especially in patients with multiple myomas. Patients with solitary fibroids have a 27% recurrence rate and those with multiple fibroids have a rate of 59%. If pregnancy occurs following myomectomy, recurrence rates are diminished as pregnancy has a protective effect on fibroid growth. The definitive option for women of perimenopausal age group who have completed their childbearing function and are willing to forego their menstrual function is hysterectomy. The route for hysterectomy depends on the size of the uterus. If the uterus is more than 12 weeks in size, that is about 250 ml in volume, then laparoscopic or robotic or abdominal hysterectomy should be undertaken. For smaller uteri, vaginal route is preferred. Ovaries, if normal, may be conserved in perimenopausal age group women. Please note that expert vaginal surgeons can remove large fibroid uteri using various uterodeductive techniques like lash technique or morselation as shown in my video here. I have also posted on my channel various videos of uterodeductive techniques of vaginal hysterectomy. The links are provided below. Advantages of hysterectomy are Eliminates the possibility of fibroid recurrence Relief from symptoms like heavy menstrual bleeding It is the only definitive treatment Malignancy can be ruled out Concurrent other surgery is possible And good long-term outcomes Disadvantages of hysterectomy are Precludes future fertility and surgical complications. Fibroids can also be treated medically in certain circumstances. Depot preparations of JNRH analogs such as decapeptin or lupridex are given at monthly intervals for 3 to 6 months. Fibroids decrease in size by about 70% and the uterus reduces in size by about 55%. GNR antagonists can also be used for treatment of fibroids. They have a more rapid action as there is no initial flare-up effect. They are indicated in selected cases, such as treatment of women approaching menopause in an effort to avoid surgery, preoperative treatment of large fibroids to facilitate hysteroscopic resection or vaginal hysterectomy, and as pre-surgical treatment to decrease symptoms, size, and augment preoperative hemoglobin levels. Antiprogestins like mifepristone or gestinone, selective estrogen receptor modulators, aromatase inhibitors, and selective progesterone receptor modulators have also been shown in few studies to decrease uterine volume and bleeding associated with fibroids. However, they have not, as yet, found a definitive place in the armamentarium for fibroid treatment. Advantages of medical treatment are 
corrects preoperative anemia. Option for late menopause transition. The main disadvantage of medical treatment is recurrence of fibroids after stopping treatment. Medicated intrauterine devices such as LNG20 IUD also have a place in the treatment of selected cases of uterine fibroids. Use of LNG20 IUD is associated with a statistically significant reduction in the total myoma volume, average uterine size, and marked reduction in menstrual blood loss. Advantages of medicated IUDs are avoids surgery, reduces menorrhagia, and prevents pregnancy. Disadvantages of LNG20 IUD are no improvement of bulk symptoms and may lose the string as the uterus enlarges. Now I will talk about newer emerging treatment modalities. Uterine fibroid embolization, formerly known as uterine artery embolization, is a minimally invasive interventional radiological procedure for treatment of uterine fibroids done under fluoroscopic control. Contraindications for uterine fibroid embolization are acute pelvic infection, asymptomatic fibroid, allergy to contrast medium, and desire for future childbearing, which is a relative contraindication. The procedure is performed under local anesthesia using a transfemoral approach. A six French sheet is passed via the contralateral femoral artery. A pelvic intraarterial digital subtraction arteriogram is obtained by injecting 25 ml bolus of contrast medium via a pigtail catheter placed above the aortic bifurcation. The target uterine artery is cannulated from contralateral root via the anterior division of the internal iliac artery. A microcatheter introduced via a diagnostic 5 French catheter is used for superselective catheterization of that branch of the uterine artery which is feeding the fibroid that is to be embolized. The decision on which side to embolize first is based on the review of the initial DSA. The site with the dominant supply to the target fibroid is embolized first. Polyvinyl alcohol foam particles 300 to 500 microns in size or 2 to 5 milliliter size platinum coils or gelatin sponge pledgets can be used for embolization. This will lead to eventual necrosis and reabsorption of the fibroid. The technical success rate is 95%. Uterine fibroid embolization is successful in controlling bleeding in 87 to 94% cases. The decrease in pain is seen in 80 to 92% cases. However, a reduction in the volume of the fibroid is seen only in 37 to 50% at the end of 6 months. Advantages of embolotherapy are minimal blood loss, fertility is preserved, rapid recovery, high efficacy for menorrhagia, improved bulk symptoms, and lower short term risk compared to hysterectomy. Disadvantages of uterine artery embolization are uncommon potential complications like severe pelvic pain and abdominal cramps, as well as nausea and vomiting that last for several days. This is known as post embolization syndrome because of uterine infarction or infection and premature ovarian failure, which is seen in less than 1% of patients. It may damage the uterus infection and it may require hysterectomy for recurrence. Another emerging modality for treatment of fibroids is MRI-focused high-frequency ultrasound. Here the patient is made to lie prone on the MRI scanner with the uterus positioned over a water tank containing the focused piezoelectric transducer array. MRI imaging enables accurate tissue targeting. It can also measure accurately the thermal damage caused by focused ultrasound. A series of high-powered ultrasound pulses called as sonications are directed into the fibroid and power is increased 
till adequate thermal dose is reached. To allow tissues to cool between treatments, ultrasound pulses lasting 15 seconds are fired at intervals of 3 minutes. The post-treatment non-perfuse volume should show significant reduction from the pre-treatment fibroid volume. The procedure takes on an average 3 to 4 hours to complete. Advantages of MRI focused high frequency ultrasound are less invasive, improved quality of life, rapid recovery, and it is safe and effective. Disadvantages are large number of sonications that would be required to treat patients with multiple fibroids, on an average 20 sonications per fibroid, less shrinkage than uterine artery embolization, limited long term data limited pregnancy data, limited availability, and it is expensive. Another alternative minimally invasive approach is laparoscopic or percutaneous technique to induce myolysis using ND agglutinators, bipolar electrodes, supercooled cryo probes, and ultrasonographically guided radiofrequency ablation. The method involves the insertion of a needle electrode multiple times into the fibroid under ultrasound guidance. Laparoscopic and percutaneous techniques of myolysis as a treatment of uterine fibroids are considered investigational. Advancements in the field of genetics may play an important role in the future treatment of fibroids. Tumor suppression genes may play an important role in controlling the progression of myoma. This is known as cytotoxic gene therapy. In conclusion, uterine fibroids are the most common benign tumors seen in gynecological practice. Very often, they are asymptomatic and no treatment is necessary. Treatment is required only for symptomatic fibroids. Until recently, treatment options were limited to therapeutic modalities like myomectomy and hysterectomy. Advances in the medical field has come a long way in developing alternative primary treatments to meet different needs and preferences of women with fibroid. Uterine fibroid embolization, focused ultrasound, and other pharmacological choices and gene-targeted drugs will continue to expand treatment modalities for the future. The future treatment may not be just therapeutic but will also be truly preventive. I will end this long e-lecture with a quote from a book by my favorite teacher, Sir T.N.A. Jeffcott. Fibroids are the reward of virtue and children the fruit of sin. As mentioned at the beginning of my talk, here are a few viva questions on fibroids. Question 1. What is leomyomatosis? Question 2. Can a fibroid ever produce hyperglycemia? Question 3. What is a wash leather fibroid? Please send their answers to my email address given below. For further reading on this topic and other topics in obstetrics and gynecology, refer to following books written by me. Practical Obstetrics and Gynecology Modern Obstetrics Modern Gynecology Clinical Cases in Obstetrics Questions and Answers Clinical Cases in Gynecology Questions and Answers and pelvic reconstructive surgery. If you have found this video useful and informative, please subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking here.